We are pleased to welcome uh, to our stage the distinguished author of a book entitled 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. The subtitle is Take Back Your Power, Embrace Change, Face Your Fears, Train Your Brain for Happiness and Success. Please welcome author and licensed clinical social worker Amy Morin. Interviewing Ms. Morn is Lawrence Jackson, President and Director of SmartFit, and Mark Green, Director of Development for the USC Veterans Programs, and of course, our own Leslie Saxon. This is a really important panel, and um, the descriptions of these people don't really describe the, the things that they've gone through in their life that led, us, that led them to Amy to write this book and kind of transition herself a little bit. And, um, my two good friends who are, who are on the panel, and I'm delighted to welcome. And I must say, when we describe life care, life care really has to support you through the changes and the traumas of life. And a lot of what we're trying to solve for, whether it be people who need a heart transplant or are suffering with some kind of chronic disease, cancer, or in these military or athletic scenarios, they're trying to solve for trauma and change as well to provide support and resiliency, because that determines success, and really importantly, it determines happiness, right? So I started working with Lawrence, and he'll describe himself, but he's a Trojan football player, and I just remember watching him play when I first came to the school and in our glory years uh, as a Trojan, and then had some transitions. And I was fortunate enough to meet Mark Green a couple years ago, and we've talked a lot about resiliency and performance. He's a former SEAL. And then Amy and I talked about how, why she wrote this book, and Lawrence turned me on to the book, because I'm like, how, do, how are we going to measure, how are we going to solve for these transitions? And, and I'm I was talking about a, a kind of a personal thing, and he said, he gave me this book. And, and I was like, that's an amazing book. And he goes, yeah, it helped me. <laughs> so then we got, we got Amy on the horn, and um, she told her story. So I, I just wonder, I want you guys to all kind of <clears throat> tell your stories a little bit, spend five minutes or so, and then if, if Lawrence, if you could just talk about, and Amy, you know, the pieces of the book that are so meaningful and help support this aspect of, of life care through these transitions. Sure. Uh, I'm a therapist, and I spent a lot of my time just working one-on-one -on -one with people in my therapy office. And in the early days of my career, my interest was really about teaching other people how to be mentally strong based on what I'd learned in textbooks and what I'd learned in college. Um, but my interest in mental strength became personal when I went through a series of losses in my own life. My mother passed away suddenly at the age of 51 from a brain aneurysm, and that was about, it was during the first year of my career as a therapist. So suddenly it became about, I was really interested in studying the people that came in my office. Uh, from a personal standpoint, I wanted to know why did some people get better faster? How come some people could bounce back uh, from tragedy and become stronger than before? And how come other people got stuck? No matter what kind of hurdle they encountered in life, they just felt like they were never able to be happy again or they could never really move forward. And I realized that it had a lot to do with what people did, but sometimes it was more about what they didn't do. And that people that didn't have certain bad habits tended to get better faster. And then on the three-year anniversary to the day of the day that my mother passed away, my 26-year-old husband died of a heart attack. And I had to figure out, how do, I, how do I move forward? Which of these bad habits do I do in my own life? How do I eliminate them? And it was with a, a new set of uh, resolve that I said, I really want to know what makes some people go through hard times and come out on the other side stronger than ever. A few years down the road, uh, I felt like my heart was healing. I was in a better place. And I, I got remarried. And I thought, how lucky am I to find love not once, but twice in my life. And shortly after I got remarried, my father-in-law was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I sat down and I thought, you know, why me? Why do I have to keep losing loved ones? This isn't fair. Uh, I don't want to go through this again. But obviously, if I'd learned anything, it was that that way of thinking is what would keep me stuck. And so I wrote a letter to myself about all of the bad mental habits that I'd learned to keep people stuck. And when I was done, I had a list of 13 things that mentally strong people don't do. And I would read over that list in the coming days, and it would help me be as strong as I could be given my circumstances. And I thought, well, if this list is helpful to me, maybe it would help somebody else. I published it on the web and stepped away from my computer, not imagining what would happen next, but 50 million people read that article. 
And so here I am years later still talking about mental strength and the bad habits that, that keep people stuck. Uh, I love, love your story and um, very happy to follow your um, explanation of your journey and everything where uh, I was uh, born and raised in Inglewood, California, grew up in a low income environment. Uh, at a very early age, I decided to play football um, professionally, I would say fifth grade. And so from fifth grade uh, through high school, it, there was this intentional focus on doing things that I felt would lead me to getting to the NFL. Um, at that age, I was too young to take significant action to increase my speed, power, and stuff like that. But it was the discipline, the academics, the, the elements that would turn me into my own worst enemy. I worked on removing those um, aspects from my journey. Uh, as I got to high school, I, I started to understand uh, my physical size, right? 6'4", 230 as a junior or a sophomore in high school. And I received scholarship offers, uh, you know, after games as a sophomore and it progressed. And I developed this sense of self that I was this athlete, right? I had gone through so much social exclusion as a kid to where I identified with my athletic potential, my ability as my personhood. And as I progressed forward, through high school, um, there was a switch between how I was embraced socially as a regular student versus how I was embraced as a star athlete. And having gone through so much, wanting to be a part of everything but not being accepted, and then being an athlete, it kind of you know uh, grabbed me in. And I ended up hurting my ankle uh, and ended up needing three surgeries after that. And it ultimately is the reason why I retired from the NFL. And through that, I felt like Job. I felt that I was forsaken. I felt that God created me to be a football player and to make an impact that way, but yet he took my ankle away from me. And so this was a battle that I fought in college. Uh, every year where I had two surgeries while I was in college, I was embarrassed, but nobody knew my fight. And so as I progressed to the NFL, uh, that small ankle injury became a big deal. And it was the minimal difference between my performance in my mind and what my body was capable of. And this led me to retire. And in the retirement process, I realized that I over-identified with who I was as a person in terms of mistaking the athlete for the person. And what I realized is that the athlete doesn't make the person, the person makes the athlete. And so, I had to, although I studied sociology and philosophy in college, it didn't mean anything to me because it hadn't hit me yet. And so when I retired, hindsight got the best of me. I looked at the fact that I could have gotten to a major. I could have spent my money more effectively. I could have did all of these, I could have done all of these things the right way, but instead I was stuck in this situation wondering what I was going to do next. And with that, having a chance to get a $50,000 check when you're 21, 22 years old, then you turn around and see $50,000, $60,000 is an annual salary for a lot of people. Things kind of get you know jacked up. It's like, man, you should have studied this, you should have studied that. And so in that, I became suicidal. I made the choice to kill myself. And at this point, I had a lot of help. But it was Amy's book who uh, really gave me a huge push going forward. Going back to that enemy, I realized that I turned myself into my own worst enemy. And so what she did was she implemented through her book the pertinent self-regulation skills that allows anybody to overcome whatever the obstacle is because life, as we all know, is not free from any obstacle for anyone, but we have to develop the tools to endure that. And so her book really gave me a defining model in which to hang uh, the process of recovery from a spiritual fracture, from uh, breakdown, from loss of identity, and really looking forward to, to building a, a better future for yourself. So um, I really thank you for writing the book. It's helped me tremendously. Obviously, I'm still alive, so <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm a 20-year retired uh, Navy SEAL, 
And I think if you go back to my high school in Dayton, Ohio, you will find out that I was the least likely person to make that journey because um, I'm constantly smiling. I always, uh, I, I'm always on the verge of laughter. Um, but then you take, uh, you know, from the time I graduated high school um, to the journey that I took to, to where, I ha where I am now, um, the thing that I'm plagued with is uh, optimism and gratitude. And Glenn Fox told me that uh, one of the best signs of um, success is gratitude. So I was a football player also. Um, I w went to Miami of Ohio and Kent State. Um, and my season or my career ended uh, one day and I threw out my shoulder and I, I couldn't play football anymore and I didn't have a, a plan B. So a friend of mine said, hey, Mark, there's this, this is a really great group of guys who, you know, the only thing that you have to do to make it is to not quit. And I was like, that's it? And he's like, yeah, they're the Navy SEALs and, you know, it's, you know, we're just going to hang out and... And it was the blind leading the blind because I was like, yeah, this is great. Yeah, and I saw this video and it was, you know, low quality. If you see it now, you'd be like, this motivate." I don't see how this motivated anybody. But uh, for me, <clears throat> I saw the, the dedication and the hardship and the test that was required because my mom always told me that I was going to be great at something one day. And I was um, on the way to failing miserably because after... My football career ended, I went back to Miami of Ohio and I was just kind of lost and I subsequently flunked out of college and then was working at a video store called Blockbuster and uh, part-time at Blockbuster um, and part-time at Walden Bookstore. And um, a friend of mine from high school came in and said, Mark, what are you doing here? And he was like, you were the quarterback of the football team and you were gonna go to the NFL, it was gonna be the next Randall Cunningham. And I just kind of looked at my name tag that said, you know, said Mark on it. And I was like, what am I doing here? So the next day, I uh, signed up for the Navy. And uh, two weeks later, I was at boot camp. And I knew that I wanted to be a SEAL, but, you know, I could do the push-ups, I could do the sit-ups and everything, but I couldn't do pull-ups. So I took my first test and failed. And um, instead of taking it as, you know, something to hold me back, I used it as fuel to get me to the next point. So every night over, over the, the bath, bathroom, they had this little um, bar that held my weight. And every night for the next four weeks, I did pull-ups until I got, I could do the minimum. And um, uh, so I made it and I was like, okay, I'm on my journey. And to backtrack, I did, there was so little information about SEALs in the Navy. I didn't even know what Navy uniforms looked like. So I show up at boot camp and I get these really ugly blue jeans and an uglier shirt. And um, I was like, no, no, I need the Navy SEAL uniform. And, uh, <laughs> and he was like, uh, yeah, nobody makes that. You're here to join the Navy. And I was like, no, no, I'm serious. I, I, I need the Navy SEAL one. And he just pushed me along because, you know, it's, it's indoctrination and just like, look, we got to get you through this thing and we're, you're designed to go to the Navy. So, um, so I, I showed up in Coronado and talked with Dr. Saxon about how you, hit your, how you hit your peak and how you come back down where you can operate. Luckily for me, I hit my peak, I hit my 10 where I can't really function through something. I hit it before everything starts. You know, I get into my own head. I'm like, ugh. What am I going to do? And then when everything settles down, I'm back at four. Right? And I never really sp spike past that. My, my spike is about a six or a seven, um, but it's, I can still function and operate. So um, I'm going through, through SEAL training, and in my head, I was like, how do I make this work in a way that I can digest it? So, you know, some people look at the course as 180 days of the worst misery that you're ever going to experience. And that's true. That is 100%. No, no kidding. Um, it hurt in ways that you can't imagine. Um, and cold water was the great equalizer. So we had Olympic athletes. We had former football players and, you know, just really talented people. But as soon as you got them in that cold water, you know, people are in the fetal position. They can't function. And I was just kind of like, well, this isn't so bad, right? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't take the longevity. If I looked at it for 180 days, I couldn't do it. However, 
I could do it in increments of three hours because they fed you every three hours. So I always had something to look forward to. So you, you take out the cold water not really being a factor. I physically could do it, and I knew I could mentally do it. So at the end of the day, I was working out on the beach. And that's how I processed that whole information. So going through that 180 days and going through Hell Week, um, it was just kind of like, okay, this is, this is fine. I'm, 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 I'm doing really well right now. And I graduated with honors. And from that spark came the person who I am today because I appreciated everything so much more. Um, so I finished my bachelor's. I became an officer. I got my MBA. Um, and I led a, a group of the most amazing men into combat um, in 2010. And the hardest thing that I did come through that was how hard transition is and how much I depend on others, my team or my locker room to, to get me through the tough times. And as you're going through, you know, SEAL training, you're never by yourself. You're never going through this by yourself. So as I transitioned, um, uh, USC really saved me because I was in a really bad place because the thing that you identified with so much was really torn away from you. You, you. The Navy does a great job of teaching you how to do the job that you're doing, but not what's next. And so I, I remember walking down um, Childs, and I said, wow, this would be a great place to work with the gentleman who brought me here. And um, through those next two years, I, I, I gained an instant family. Um, and I really just, I work for a wonderful gentleman named Mark Todd. Um, I have really great colleagues, and they really help me heal and figure out what's next. So, um, yeah, I, I, really, I, I really love this place, and I really can't describe it, but it's, it's an instant family that I really can't describe that I need, um, and it really, it really gets me through um, the tough times, which the tough times are very incremental now. It's uh, tough times for 20 minutes, vice, days, or weeks. Um, so... You know, I didn't know how strong I was until I was tested in, in the Navy, and then I didn't know how strong I was until I was tested here. So uh, I, don't, I don't know what it is about USC, but I drank the Kool-Aid, <laughs> added some sugar, and uh, now I'm, uh, I'm a student here, and I can't wait to be a member of the Trojan family. So um, for all you Trojans out there in this, this wonderful campus and you wonderful people, I really just want to say thank you. So... In so many ways, this is what we're trying to like help solve for. With, do you need the suffering? You know, maybe the suffering. We're trying to get rid of it, but it is the, it is the thing, right? So, Amy, can you just talk through your principles? And you've got some of the strongest guys ever, and they were built for it, right? Came up hard, and then incredible physical pain, then intelligent enough to read and all all that stuff. Yet, you know, they stuff happens, and even the transition can break many of us, right? Because we identify so strongly with our success. So. Just help, help us with that. How do we digitize this, what you've done, and, and integrate it? Yeah, I think so often we, um, we like to think that we're strong, and then until you're tested, you don't really know. And then when uh, life sh gets shaken up and you have to figure out where's your foundation, what, where do you, um, how do you build your self-worth, what's it built on? Um, and I found with so many people in my therapy office, it's just about changing the way they think and knowing that they can think differently, you can respond to your thoughts um, in a more helpful way when you tend to be more on the um, negative side. And then it's about managing your emotions. How do you manage your emotions so that your emotions don't control you? And then it's about taking positive action. And there's definitely exercises that you can do. There's strategies, and um, but a lot of people just have no idea how. So, for instance, if you break down a 180 days into how do you get through the next three hours, that's a great skill. Um, how do you find all of these skills, and how do you then make sure that you give up your bad habits? Um, I often say you're only as good as your worst habits, so it's about identifying those and getting rid of them. Um, and I found in uh, teaching and talking about this, uh, you know, so many people just have either never heard of mental strength, they have no idea what to do. Um, I started an online course that has uh, 
surprised me that it's done so well in foreign countries. When I created the course, it wasn't something that I thought about. Um, but so many countries around the world that don't have access to health care, and especially mental health care. Um, so it's, it started the conversation um, about how to do that. But then I think, now where do you go from here? We know that CBT skills change people's brains. When people learn cognitive behavioral therapy skills, it physically changes their brain. It's something that all of us have the power to do. It's just a matter of getting the word out there and practicing the skills. And you, you told me that your practice Somehow the book seems to specifically resonate with like performers, um, like these gentlemen. What is it? A, what do you think it is? And I know you told me a bunch of athletes and others reach out to you all the time. Yeah, when I wrote the book, I didn't necessarily have a target audience in mind because I certainly I never imagined the article was going to resonate with so many people. But the different groups of people that have reached out to me um, has been quite interesting. And one of them is uh, athletes, from NBA players to um, NFL players. Um, and, and people in the performing arts as well. And uh, I don't really know. I think for a lot of people, um, we see that they think that because they are self-disciplined and because they are successful, then people have this assumption that they're already mentally strong, that they can get through anything. Um, and Lawrence can speak to more of this uh, probably better than I can, but the people who talk to me will say that. They'll say from the outside looking in, people think I have it all together, but on the inside, I don't feel like I do, and I need help with that. Lawrence, you, you're working on something really important. Um, just SmartFit is an example of it, but you and I have talked a lot. I've talked to Mark a lot about how do we train people mentally and physically? How do we marry cognition with physicality, and how do we test that and build that back in once it's injured? Because once your body's injured, your mind, you know, how do we create that? How do we train for that? Yeah, I think that the, the first step is uh, the initiatives and the action that you guys have taken to bring this sort of technology um, into popular conversation, right, where a lot of the um, old philosophical principles are now being proven through neuroscience, right? And so the things that we thought before were fluff and not relevant and something that, oh yeah, you can do that or you don't have to do that. Those things are proven from a neuroscience level to be fundamental, right? And so with vision training um, and the cognitive visual interface, right? You have to understand that 80% of the sensory uh, information that we bring in comes through our eyes, right? So this is how we see the world. When we talk about the, the attachment to um, ego or uh, career or profession where it's a loss, right? That messes up your per perception and the way that you are operating within your uh, professional space. So if you have um, an injury or you have some circumstance where you're unable to clear out the emotional space, now you have that distraction that's in your way with performance and, and vision training and the co cognition or the cognitive aspect of it goes into what uh, we talk about with deliberate practice. A lot of people don't understand that life is art, right? And we are all artists. And if you go back to um, the Greeks and how they looked at performance, it's different in terms of how you scale the ladder of excellence. You don't just stop at one thing like, oh, this is hard. It's, uh, uh, the Socratic method, how can I improve on here? If the brain is such this uh, a nucleus of the human experience, and the eyes are the gateway to that brain, if you intertwine that and, and do it in reasonable ways through sports, right, where sports vision training reduces injury, decreases the optimal uh, performance gap, uh, it brings a new level of entertainment to not only uh, uh, the fans, but it brings injury prevention, it brings mental health, it brings uh, longer term cognitive development, it helps with academics and all of these elements that are core when we're talking about transition, right? If you don't have um, uh, an ability through cognitive endurance to read and you're just focusing on sport, you're not going to have the uh, uh, the recovery and the transitional literacy that you need to move forward. So with vision training, it's really an opportunity to tap into the cognitive system and the brain and really weed out some of the things that we didn't know had a, a, a name, but we knew how to face. With vision training, you can target specific areas and create monumental improvement. So Mark, we're trying to bring some of this, like how do we give military um, trainees these kind of reps within training scenarios. We talked about it 
either down at the school or for a CEO or whomever, how do we create a system where we can give those reps that will then provide a person the resiliency to transition into operations or any out of oper out of the military, whatever? Um, I found that it, for me, it was it was the structure and the way Buds was and um, the way the the SEAL teams were. That was a way that I I the way they taught it was the way I happened to learn, and I think that. Um, and I could keep up with the pace, but I think some of the guys who are 90% there or even 80% there, they just need a little bit more time or they just may think a different way. And I know that that takes a lot of uh, time and money to invest in that, but I think, um, you know, there, there are some things that I didn't do so well and I just had the luxury of, of, of time that I sought out um, things that helped me get better. So. Um, I wasn't a great swimmer, and my, um, the meanest instructor I've ever met, his name is Corey Knowles. If I ever see him again, I was like, <laughs> I'm still afraid of that guy. <laughs> but um, he was in the midst of a rant, and I was like, look, I, in my mind, I was like, I need, to, I need to figure out how to swim more because I just wasn't getting the reps. So in the middle of a rant, it was so important for me to get through this, this program is that he's still red in the face. I was like, hey, uh, Instructor Knowles, I need to come in on Saturdays um, to help to help with, with my swimming. And no kidding, he was in, enraged, and he looks at me. He's like, "Oh yeah, Mark, uh, ten o'clock." <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and I was like, uh, "Yeah, yeah, for you. you're good. I'm good at 10. And you know, it was just their their job is to get the people who want to get through that training to get through it. So I had to find um, I had to find my extra reps. But that's when I learned that, you know, I just. I just need a little bit more time, and for the course to build that in is, is difficult, but for the individual to build that in, is, it's not quite as hard. So with all the technology we have today and YouTube videos and just interconnectivity, you can really get those reps um, in a way that, I, that wasn't available to me when I, was, um, well, when I needed the reps. I just had to go up to the guy who was screaming and hope that it worked, and it happened to work. And uh, I never ended up being a great swimmer. Um, <laughs> I could just swim in a straight line for a mile, and my swim buddy could swim really fast, but he couldn't swim straight. So I'd go straight, and he'd bump into me like this. So together, we made one good swimmer, right? <laughs> so, so, and that's how we got through it. And, you know, I was his extra rep. So as we're swimming and in misery, he's asking me how I do it, and, you know, I'd have him take over. And, you know, by the end of it, I was his teacher on how to um, swim straight, and he was my teacher on how to swim fast. So, um, and that's just one thing. And you know, I was a I was a sniper for 15 of my 20 years, and um, same thing. I just didn't process information the way they put it out to me at sniper school. But once I went to went outside and figured it out and taught myself the way that my brain works and then it's a light came on and then you know I was unstoppable and um, I think that's once we once we figure out that the military is great at hey we got to mass produce this thing and we have to we have a very limited amount of time but I think now with the work that you're doing we're we're quantifying what makes it work whatever it is and if we can then take the next step and say okay this kid who's almost there, he doesn't learn in this way. Why don't we take him off to the side and figure out how he learns, stop him from panicking, come back to whatever his level of functionality is, and then I think he'll, he'll progress, he or she will progress um, once they figure out what their it is. And um, I, just, I just got lucky. I don't, I don't know if I was just too much of a knucklehead to quit or, or what, I, or I, it, was, it was more of a desire and a need to learn and to be successful at what I was uh, what I was doing, so um, that's what. Yeah, that that's super helpful. I, um, the, the other thing that we you know we haven't talked about is people with chronic disease. You think about what we do with them. We give them no resiliency training. We give them nothing um, because it's a huge adjustment disorder. When I saw some of the early treatments at ICT for PTSD, whether it was VR or virtual humans or no you know judgment for disclosure kind of technologies, I thought to myself, I bet half my patients have PTSD. 
You know, they have a heart pump, they have this or that, and they have zero. Um, and it's really hard to live with that stuff, and it directly impacts their outcomes. I mean, there's just no question about it. We just completely ignore it for the most part. Um, and then we pat ourselves on the back. We had an extra five mm -hmm. minutes of patience after that case or during the... Uh, because we're pretty up our own widgets in medicine, the doctors were, were like the ultimate martyrs, and, and we're good and we work hard, but in a lot of ways we're like, it's so hard on us, and I'm sure this is similar in military and other things, it's very hard to extend that all the time, right? Um, any, any, you know, we, so Amy, I don't know, any way we can, you know, we can build this in for people for life care is kind of where we're trying to go. Um, questions, comments, uh, ideas? Sir, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, hold on. Pediatrician here. I, I was going to ask about, about uh, kind of daily life skills, like uh, chronic disease has to get up and go shopping and think to call Lyft, or somebody who's with early cognitive decline where they're not Alzheimer's, they're quite functional, but they're not functioning to capacity. Um, uh, to me, there's a lot of room here for the adaptive kind of technology to bump up function to where people are used to functioning and, and used to thinking, you know, memory. And, uh, anybody have any idea how to integrate that as opposed to talk about it, you know? You, we tend to talk to patients and say, go get it, as opposed to say, come here and get it and we'll show you how. Good point. Anyone else? Um, Glenn, come on. <laughs> this is your. Actually, um, I, I'd like to ask Mark and Lawrence a question about um, a little off topic. Uh, what do you do? What is the role of fun and joy during those tough times? And actually, also for Amy as well, like, what do you see as? ways to generate joy, which I again don't equate with happiness, but what are the ways to have fun and enjoy um, those, those pivotal inflection moments in life? Uh, you wanna start? Yeah, um, Glenn, do you mind if I just do my do seal stuff? Yeah. Okay, so um, once, I, once I got there um, and I knew I wasn't gonna quit, I realized I wasn't gonna quit the first, first day, and once I broke it up into chunks, um, the, all you have left to do is enjoy it and laugh. And I've never laughed so hard um, as we were in that, in that training because, you know, there's humor in everything. And we'd get bored and there are rocks around. So, of course, we start throwing rocks at each other. And, you know, um, somebody messes up or does something and just... It, it's so infectious that I, everyone's got that tension, and as soon as it, the first dam breaks, everyone just, y y you, you laugh through it. And I, I don't think there's a way to make it through something that arduous and that long without <clears throat> maintaining your sense of humor. So um, you know, I did an event last week, and you know, seals are just big teddy bears with a different job. And we laugh just like everyone else, um, and we have, extreme amounts of joy in what we're doing because if you're going to go through that process and volunteer for it and and make it you want to be there so you know you're you're eliminating a lot of the bad and all that's really left is the camaraderie and the and the great times with your friends and who become family and you share so much of life together and it's really you're just happy most of the time or a lot of the time I'm not going to say most of the time because a lot of it sucks but um, a lot of it is is fun and and uh, brings a lot of joy I think for for me, it's taking a look at what joy means by definition and what happy means by definition. Joy is a state of mind. Happiness is an emotion, right? So there are people who are happy eating McDonald's while it's killing them, right? But there are people who take joy in going months and years without pay to bring an idea to life, right? And so for me, it comes down to passion and purpose, right? When, when I hear you guys talk about the, 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 the culture in America, right? It's something that I'm hearing, it's a, a, an absence of purpose and intention. It, uh, we're so caught up in winning and getting the trophy 
and not caught up in the process, right? The journey is the destination in the sense that if I'm seeking to be X, right, I know that A, B, and C might not make me happy, but what I do with A, B, and C is gonna help me with M, N, O, P, right? And so I compound that strength from the lessons that I learn, right? And that's the joy in the growth, right? Life isn't always fun. Growth isn't fun. Like, how many of you started squatting for the first time and realized how unfun it was to sit down, right? <laughs> but you want that progress, so you endure, right? So for me, through football, uh, there were hard times. The depression, the, you know, uh, the idea of performance failure. But the purpose, right, is me getting into a better situation in life. So, yeah, I'm not happy with this, but I'm joyful because this bad is going to help me get closer to the good. So. Amy? Oh, so we have a question. Or did you have a comment and then we take question? Uh, you know, I was just going to say in my therapy office, too, I worked with a lot of people who delay happiness because they think I'll be happy when the kids leave or I'll be happier when I have a new job. And same with joy, that it's hard to accept joy, I think, for a lot of people. And I've been in that situation myself. So to know that... Um, you can be joyful no matter what you're going through and that if it is painful that you can be joyful at the same time and it's a daily decision that you make. Hi, uh, I'm Wendy Dombrowski. I'm a physician and also have a strong interest in movement and human performance. Thanks, Lawrence and Mark, for sharing your stories. Um, I have two questions that are somewhat related. One is, um, you know, it's, you know, I, I want to thank you for sharing about the struggles you went through because I feel like in the current culture it's not really acceptable for people who are stars and successful people to say that it was hard, it, it was hard before, it's hard now. And so I was wondering are there any ways that you would recommend how the culture can be changed where it's okay for either people who are already stars or even kids and you know teenagers who are aspiring to be either a sports star or successful in business or successful in whatever area, how can it be okay for them to talk about their challenges? And then the second question is, you know, several of you had mentioned that so much of our identity is tied to what our dream job is. Or, um, you know, when I grow up, I want to be, you know, I want to be a football player. Or when I grow up, I want to be a doctor or whatever that is. And, you know, how can we change the culture around tying our identity solely to what our role or job function or our awards are versus tying our identity to, to something that's not necessarily just like, like our jobs? Thanks. Uh on the surface, initially, um, it makes me think about the purpose of pursuit, right? If you say, hey, I want to be the next Tom Brady because Tom Brady is all over ESPN, right? <clears throat> when you start going through stuff, A, you're going to be more likely to quit because there's no real uh, commitment to it. Uh, but then what's really motivating you when times get hard? I think that the solution is that we get back to artistry and apprenticeship. Like someone mentioned it uh, earlier, right? The biggest aspect of what you're saying is sort of like the NCAA college athlete debate, right? On whether or not they should get paid. You have a chance to come to a school, get an education, improve your skill set, all of that stuff by leveraging your athletic ability, right? That's a journey where myself, I saw the perspective, I'm from Inglewood. USC wasn't gonna admit me just based off of my academic performance coming out of high school, right? So I had to step into that and see a bigger purpose. So I think that at the outset, you know, whether it's in the house, whether it's teachers, whether it's uh, uh, older, uh, older family members, we have to do a better job of properly directing kids on a pursuit like no there is no uh, participation trophy like talent is overrated and that's a great book that everyone should read where we're getting aside from the the process and the fact that Kobe is Kobe because he worked LeBron is LeBron because he worked not because they're this freakishly gifted alien that's been transported to earth right and so if you understand that the space between productivity and disappointment is hard work or personal ability, then it becomes easy. If you don't have the ability, 
right? I can take the fact that if I want to shoot threes, I just don't have, like, whatever, ability to shoot threes biomechanically, right? But what I can't do is not try, right? But a lot of people get all of that confused with the direction of the journey. Dr. Saxon, will you please make some final comments about this wonderful panel, no, I was just, and then I have a special announcement. Okay. No, I just want to thank you all for sharing, and I think these are the, these are the really tough ones to, to build into solutions that scale, and um, the, the insights are, are fantastic, so thank you. Thank you. A huge and special thank you. <laughs>